All right, so today we're going to be talking about why did World War I begin? And I want you to think about the last video that I had you guys listen to about the alliances in Europe and think about the question, did the alliance system uh, really stabilize Europe? And let's move on then to the first question. Is why would nationalism weaken the stability of Europe? Now, if you remember from eighth grade, um, or maybe from the last video, the main reasons for the causes of World War I are usually spelled out using the phrase mania. And mania stands for militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and assassination. So we already talked about nation oh we already talked about alliances. We talked about that in the last video. And really, if you think about imperialism, we talked about for a whole unit. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about the idea of nationalism and how nationalism is going to lead to a weakening of the stability of Europe. And part of that nationalism or the rise of nationalism that we see in Europe during this time period is really kind of linked to the age of imperialism because there was a lot of rivalries between the European powers over colonies and over trade. France was still mad at Germany because in 1871, France and Germany fight a pretty major war called the Franco-Prussian War, in which Germany is successful. So France is pretty still, because think about it, this is 1871. Now we're talking about the early 1900s. So you're only talking about 30 years later. So France was still mad at Germany for the defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. And the Germans were really quite concerned with the formation of the Triple Entente. And they wanted to test it. They wanted to see if the Triple Entente really was... Um, like a strong alliance. So in March of 1905, William II of Germany makes a speech, and in this speech he calls for Moroccan independence. Now Morocco at the time was a colony of France, and so the German government is demanding that an international conference is held um, in order to discuss the issue of Moroccan independence, and the conference is held in 1906. You now everyone's kind of a little bit kind of confused about why Germany is doing this, especially because all the other powers that are called to this conference are also major colonial, have major colonial holdings. So why are they going to support the idea of France giving up hold on its colony of Morocco? But the conference basically supported French claims and the incident that Germany tried to create was blocked. Um, basically, everyone kind of backed France and Britain's kind of walking out of that a little bit disturbed, kind of thinking like, well, what the heck is Germany up to? And it actually kind of pulls Germany and France closer together. Uh, excuse me, pulls Germany, pulls France and Britain, sorry, closer together. Now, another major issue in regards to nationalism is the issue of the Ottoman Empire, which we talked about in class this week, and also the Austrian Empire. Now, the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire both are multinational empires with large populations of Slavs, S-L-A-V-S. So the Slavic people live in Eastern Europe. And for centuries, the Slavic people have either been dominated by either the Ottomans or the Austrians or the Russians, even though the Russians are Slavic as well. And they've never really been strong enough to develop their own country, partly because there's lots of different Slavic groups and they would all be kind of very small and fractured little countries. So there was a movement that was building um, in the 19th going into the 20th century that was known as Pan-Slavism, P-A-N-S-L-A-V-I-S-M. And this idea is that all the Slavic people should band together in one big country. Um, and this movement was led by Serbia. So Serbia was a small country that had recently gotten their independence for large portions of their history had been either dominated by excuse me, the Austrians or the Ottomans. And so they had managed to get their independence and they really wanted to bring all the Slavic groups together into one country. Um, one of the major areas that the Serbs wanted to bring into their pan-Slavic state was a region that was controlled by the Austrians. Um, and actually, it's kind of a strange situation because it's technically part of the Ottoman Empire, but it is being controlled by the Austrians. Um, and that's the country of, hold on, I thought my pen was working. It's called Bosnia. Herzegovina. Let me just figure out where I lost it. I lost it. So this was a Slavic state um, that was technically part of the Ottoman Empire, but being administered by Austria. And the 
Serbians wanted it to be part of their pan-Slavic state. And Austria was continually blocking any attempt by Serbia um, to gain control of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and eventually, actually, the, Ottoman, the Austrian Empire actually formally annexes Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, after, um, well, prior to World War I, there was actually a series of wars that were fought um, as the Ottoman Empire was breaking up. Um, it won, they were known as the Balkan Wars. One was in 1912, the other was in 1913, and both were fought over Ottoman lands. Remember, we talked about how in class, since the Ottoman Empire was the sick man of Europe, and everyone's kind of like chipping away on the edges of the Ottoman Empire. So these groups of people, these Slavic people, this area that's kind of like in um, kind of conflict with the Austrians and the, Bos and, the, um, and the Ottomans, it's a various different group of people. Even though they're all kind of Slavic, even though they have a similar language family, they do speak different languages. So they spoke different languages. They spoke the same language, sorry, but they had different alphabets. And there, there were some differences between their language. So you had the Serbs. As we already just mentioned, so you have the Serbs, you have the Bosnians, fair wrote down, you have the Croats, you have the Slovenes. So these are all these different groups that were kind of trying to create this idea of one, what they called Yugo Slavia, which literally meant land of the southern Slavs. They wanted to kind of unite together as one country. Um, but in 1900, the Slavic nationalists really knew that Austria-Hungary was never going to grant them equal status. They were never going to really be able to make this come to pass. Now, also going on during this time period in 1908, we talked about this already, the Young Turk Revolution, um, and the Young Turks were trying to modernize Turkey, and they were trying to strengthen the empire. At the same time, Russia, we already talked about this, is trying to gain control of Constantinople, and Austria uh, makes the decision. Austria eventually, like I said, is going to, annex Bosnia to discourage this whole idea of pan-Slavism. And one of the things that happens leading up to this is in Russia and Austria, who traditionally do not like each other because they're both competing over the same land in the Ottoman Empire, decide in 1908 to make a secret agreement. There was an upcoming international conference um, where all the great powers in Europe were going to get together, and Russia said to Austria, look, I'll support the idea of you annexing Bosnia, if you, Austria, support the idea of the straits being open to Russian warships and the straits being those straits in between around Istanbul to get out of the Black Sea. So the agreement was Russia would back Austria getting Bosnia, Austria would back Russia getting control or at least access to the straits. Now, prior to this conference, Austria kind of jumps ahead and without warning annexes Bosnia, which completely infuriates the Serbs. Um, and basically at this international conference, everyone's like ganging up on Austria, like Austria, how could you have done this? You weren't supposed to do this. This is, you know, upsetting the balance of power. And Russia basically stands up and says, you know, I support the idea of Austria annexing Bosnia. We think the Austrians should be allowed to keep it. Everyone's kind of like, well, that's strange. Usually Austria and Russia hate each other, but okay. Austria gets to keep Bosnia. Later in the conference, the issue of Russia having access to the Straits comes up. Russia looks to Austria, and Austria does nothing. Austria does not defend Russia like they said they were, and basically makes Russia look like a fool, and Russia doesn't get control of the Straits like they had wanted. So that creates a lot of bad blood between Austria and Russia, and they're going to be on opposite sides of each other in World War I. Now, basically... Austria's influence in the region is growing, and the Slavic people constantly are being frustrated. So anytime Serbia is trying to make a move, like in those, uh, those Balkan wars I kind of talked about in 1912 and 1913, being fought over Ottoman lands, the, Bal the, the Serbs are always being blocked. So basically, um, anytime, like, you know, Serbia wants to get access to the coast, it's decided to make a new country of Albania, which basically landlocks Serbia. Um, Serbia wants to annex Bosnia, wants Bosnia to be part of Yugoslavia, Austria annexes Bosnia. So this is just kind of an example of how Serbian nationalism was just being constantly blocked. Now the next question is, how do these conditions lead to war? And so basically what you're seeing happening is you already have the fact 
that these countries have large imperial empires and they're constantly competing for these empires. We already have that there's this alliance system that's already set in place that really can create a domino effect. We also have the issue because of industrialization. Uh, the first M in mania is militarism. And because of the Industrial Revolution, all of these countries have all of these weapons. There has been so much technology that has been going on since the last major war, which really was the Napoleonic Wars in the beginning of the 19th century. And so tons of new weapons have been invented and technology is really starting to move faster. And they haven't had a chance to actually try them out. So it's like they have all these cool weapons and they don't really know what they can do. So that's And they're kind of developing this arms race where different countries are competing with each other, trying to see who has the biggest army, the biggest navy, the most warships, so on and so forth. Um, and so basically it's putting, it's every incident, all these various different Bosnian incidents, these incidents with Russia, Morocco, everything is becoming a test of strength. Each power must stand by their allies no matter what. And so it's kind of starting to back people into corners that they would not have initially wanted to be in in the first place. Now, as far as Germany, Germany was facing its own internal domestic crisis. Uh, you have the Social Democrats, who were the largest party in the Reichstag in 1912, that were anti-militarist and anti-war. And the German imperial government basically just chose like not to listen to them. So the emperor is not listening to the Reichstag, and the Reichstag is the um, legislature. Um, and the imperial government was really being influenced by like the old traditional elites who are very militaristic. And the moderates and the liberals within Germany really wanted to see Germany become a major power. So they were kind of in between, but they would accept the idea that for Germany to become a major power, Germany might have to go to war. So the alliance system was a symptom of a larger problem in Europe, basically, that economically, um, the world is very international. The economies are becoming interconnected. However, on the flip side, nationally, these countries are becoming more separate because of these growing feelings of nationalism. So how did the assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand lead to war? So Francis Ferdinand was um, the heir to the Ottoman throne. Excuse me, sorry, the heir to the Austrian throne. So he was the heir to the Austrian throne. He was the oldest brother of the Austrian emperor. Um, and so with the annexation of Bosnia, he is sent to Sarajevo, which is the capital of Bosnia, to kind of commemorate the annexation. So he goes on this, like, tour around Sarajevo. Um, everyone knew that this visit was going to be happening. The parade route was actually published in the newspapers, which really was kind of a foolish thing to do. So a Serbian secret society known as the Black Hand kind of planted assassins all along this um, parade route, kind of waiting for the, the Archduke to come by with his wife because they were riding by in an open car. Um, and so, unfortunately, um, one of the assassins was successful, a man by the name of Josef Princip, uh, Gavriel Princip, sorry. So here he is being kind of arrested. Here is the funeral procession. And it's actually really kind of a sad story. Um, well, I mean, it's a sad story because the, the Archduke and his wife gets assassinated, but it, it was like a comedy of errors because there was an earlier attempt, there was like a car bomb that happened in an uh, earlier in the parade. So the parade was stopped. The Archduke went to visit the person who was injured in the hospital, and then it was decided that they were going to continue with their um, this procession through 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 Sarajevo. Most of all, the assassination the assassins kind of realized they weren't going to be able to make the kill. Um, one of the assassins, Gabrielle Princip, who was the one who was successful, like gives up, goes inside to like go get a sandwich, is walking outside with his sandwich and sees the Archduke's car, and it got like trapped down this little tiny street and was like kind of like into a dead end street and basically was backing itself up down the street because it kind of got lost and Gabriel Princeoff walks out, you know, walks out with his sandwich and he's like, holy crap, there's the Archduke and shoots him and his wife. Um, so Austria was understandably very upset at the assassination of their heir to the throne. So they decided that they had had it up to here with Southern Slavic nationalism and Austria issues an ultimatum to Serbia. Um, and basically says, look, Serbia, we are going to come into Serbia, our Austrian officials. We are going to conduct the investigation. 
we are going to arrest the people that are guilty and we are going to be the ones who are going to try the guilty parties. Um, the Serbians are kind of like, no, because that's a complete rejection of our sovereignty. Like that would be less saying, you know, us saying to Canada, look, we're going to come in and arrest your citizens, which would not fly. Um, and the Serbians were counting on the support of Russia. So the Serbians were Slavic, the Russians were Slavic. The Serbians knew that the Slav that the Serbians knew that the Russians and the Austrians did not get along, especially after the incident at that conference in 1906. So Russia knew that they they knew that Russia was not going to want to lose any face. So Serbia basically is counting on the fact that Russia is going to have their back. The Russians, and this is where the whole alliance system is coming into play. The Russians um, were counting on France, knowing that France had their back because France did not want to get caught alone in a war with Germany. And so they knew that the, the Russians knew that the French were willing to keep Russia as an ally no matter what. And so they basically gave what they refer to as the blank check to Russia. Basically, France said, Russia, do whatever you feel is necessary. We got you. And Russia is basically kind of saying to Serbia, do whatever you got to do. We got you. So the Serbians do not agree to Austria's demands. As a result, Austria declares war on Serbia and Russia comes to Serbia's aid. Since Austria is supported by Germany, Germany decides to, to declare war on, sorry, wait. Since Austria is supported by Germany, Russia decides to declare war on Germany. Germany declares war on Russia. This is on August 1st, 1914. Then Germany declares war on France on August 3rd, 1914. Um, all of the German decisions that were being made were based on the hope that Great Britain would not enter the war. They didn't want to see Britain enter into the war. Um, basically, Britain at this point was really kind of staying out of it. They weren't really getting involved. What happens then is the Germans come up with this a plan that's known as the Schieflin Plan. The reason why it's called the Schieffen Plan is because that's the general who kind of con conceived of it. Now, the idea of this is that the Germans wanted to quickly knock France out of the war, thinking that if they quickly knocked France out of the war, that, they, that the British are not going to want to get involved because Germany and Austria did not want to fight a two-front war. So the, Austria, the, the Germans knew that this border between France and Germany is going to be where the, the, the strongest of the French fortresses and fortifications is going to be. Belgium up here is a neutral country. So there are some Belgian troops here on the border of Germany and there's some Belgian troops here on the border of France, but really not, nothing really too strong because it's a neutral country. So Germany's decision is that they're going to take the bulk of their troops, send them into Belgium, because they can easily kind of go around the fortifications, so come in through Belgium, down into northern France, take Paris, swing back around, and then hit the French army from behind. This idea that is predicated on the fact that if France gets very quickly knocked out of the war, then the idea is that Britain's not going to want to get involved. The idea also behind this is that um, the bulk of the German army has to be put on these front lines, and basically the west, the eastern front, which is the border with Russia, is going to be kind of left open for a time. But they figured that because Russia is so far behind, it would take Russia a long time to mobilize and they would have the time to catch up. That's the theory. What winds up happening is Schieffelin dies, different generals take over. They decide to go ahead with the plan, but they're fearful of leaving the complete eastern front open, that border with Russia. They decide to leave some troops on the border with Russia, a significant amount number that it kind of weakens the German army. So instead of the German army, which was definitely stronger than the French army, but by leaving some of those troops back on the border with Russia, you've now weakened the German army. So when the German army meets against the French army, they essentially wind up becoming into a stalemate. And because Britain is angry that Germany violated Belgium's neutrality, this brings Britain into the war. Um, so you can see this is what the landscape of northern uh, France, southern Belgium looks like. So you can see how easy it would be for troops just to kind of come right through here. So when the war starts, a like fervor of nationalism and patriotism erupts. You know, people are so excited to, you know, 
cheering and everyone is you know joining up to side to recruit for the army so he could see this is in in london people you know lining up down the block to sign up for the british army to join in the war effort so i want you to think about this question because we're going to talk about this a lot in class who was the who was the cause for world war one and could world war one have been prevented 